What's up y'all, welcome back to the channel. I haven't done an album roundup in a while and so today's video is just gonna be talking about some newer-ish albums and I'll probably miss one of your favorites, but hey, I'm just one person, do the best I can. Everything's timestamped down below, so feel free to click around. And uh, the merch has now been out for a full week and I'm just so thankful that people are starting to get their merch and post it. If you want one of these, it's okay to think about country music shirts in Heather Mauve. You can check it out at gradysmithshop.com. For reference, this was the original. So here's the color difference of kind of what it was, what it is. Um, there you go. First up, let's talk about Midland's new EP, The Last Resort. And then somebody says your name, and I'm right back. As you probably know, Midland already released an album this year called The Sonic Ranch, and this was actually early recordings of the band with a way more lo-fi sound. And although the band honed in on a more kind of glossy, kind of rockabilly, honky-tonk, but still very mainstream sound on their albums On the Rocks and Let It Roll, on The Last Resort, you can feel them bringing in some of that early influence into their established sound, and what you get is something that just sounds intoxicatingly good. This is definitely gonna give you shades of the Eagles with all of the harmonies and kind of soft rock vibes that are going throughout it, but it just sounds so damn beautiful. And the moon first song released from this EP, Sunrise Tells the Story, is still my favorite thing on the whole collection. It's just got this sophisticated, woozy romance about it where this couple is singing about essentially a tryst in the nighttime and how the moon saw it through the glass. And although they describe this hookup kind of as a crime and that they're, the evidence, their clothes are strewn all through the room, there's this great little twist at the end of the chorus where it says, the night knows the truth, but the sunrise tells the story. That song not only has great steel guitar work, which adds some of that woozy quality I always talk about with Midland, but just great guitar work, and especially when it's lower in the guitar range. I just love those low guitar sounds. They feel so Western and wondrous to me. But really, I think the big difference in this song and a lot of other Midland ones is how prominent the harmony is. They're not just trying to make it all Mark's lead vocal. Two to Two Step is another one that I really love. It's super fun. You get that honky-tonk energy. The song is simple, it takes two to two step. It's just a little flirtation there, but man, that thing moves and grooves. And then my other favorite one on here was Adios Cowboy. Adios Cowboy, oh, you take it? It's a lot more heartbroken because this girl left her ring and the wine glass and wrote a note that said, Adios Cowboy to these guys. And it's a little more of a sad song, but geez, the harmony and the electric guitar movement on that just makes it go down so easy. This whole album does. This is one of the most listenable groups of songs I've heard all year. I mean, Midland is just production masters. The stuff they have going on with Shane McAnally and Josh Osborne and their sound, it's just ear candy. And not like a cheap candy either. Not like some crappy little, I actually love those little strawberries, but that's what I was thinking of. Just some crappy little plasticky candy. It is like, I don't know, it's like caramel. It's rich and it's fancy, but all those themes of indulgence and hookups and cigarettes and being in the neon, all that stuff's there. I need to take advantage of Midland Sound and kind of red pill people into the red dirt scene, red dirt pill people into the kind of independent country scene, I will say, and show them cheap silver and solid country gold by Mike and the Moon Pies, because I feel like people that like this would like that too. I always feel just a touch of distance with Midland's songwriting. I don't feel like it's that confessional or personal in any kind of way. It feels like it's a little bit more almost a cinematic experience, but man, these are really well-crafted songs. I think I just have to give this EP like an eight out of 10. Here's what people had to say about it on the Country Music Stuff subreddit. Every song is great. Love that they're getting away from the Playboy vibe of Let It Roll a little bit. Love that album, but that style had its run. The little guitar lick on That's As Leaving As It Gets in Adios Cowboy and the final chorus of And Then Some are some of my favorite parts. Midland is just so pleasant on the ears. I'm one of those fans who truly enjoyed Let It Roll, but I gotta say I'm really pleased with this return to the original 14 Gears type sound that introduced me to Midland and really got me hooked on them in the first place. I love Midland's first album, but was never really able to get into their second album that much. I'm absolutely loving this EP though. Up next is Brian Kelly's Sunshine State of Mind. 
I already did a video on the Beach Cowboy EP and when Brian Kelly was sort of venturing out, as they say, from Florida Georgia Line. And if you saw that, you know I have been intrigued to see what he is going to do as a solo artist. And I really was super impressed with this whole album. I know for some people, they're just gonna hear, hey, this is one of the two guys in Florida Georgia Line. I'm literally never checking that out. It's trash. But if you go into this album with an open mind, ready for a fun, beachy experience, I promise you, you're going to enjoy it. This is an album quite simply about the beach. It's about being on the water. It's about being at the beach. It's about liking being on the water or liking being on the beach. And it's about liking his woman and especially liking her on a boat, on the water, or on the beach. In a like deep, profound, philosophical sense, I don't think Brian has all that much to say, but good gracious, he says the things he does say with a ton of creativity and great vocabulary. All the Spanish moss and cobblestones and crab traps and haciendas and maritime meditations, all of that just paints such a different picture with new images that I haven't heard before about beach life. I also love how many proper names he drops in the lyrics where I don't even know necessarily what they are, but you can use your context clues and figure them out. When he talks about being on the war wolf, you gather that he's on a fishing boat. He mentions Hemingway at one point when he's singing about the Florida Keys. He'll name drop a city like Ormond Beach. All of it just feels really lived in and real. But in an album of 17 songs, sometimes it's gonna feel a little bit like it's dragging, especially when the thematic content is so similar. There's a few tracks on here like Boat Ride that just kind of blend into some of the more dynamic ones. And there's one song on here called Real Good Day that's kind of the poppiest, trap beatiest of any of them here. And that's not for me. Still, I think the good way outweighs the bad and makes for a really pleasant, fun pop country sound. It's kind of like a Kenny Chesney album if it didn't have the sad side of a Kenny Chesney album. We be riding all day. On that highway and a lot of times it's surprisingly country. I mean, Janae Fleener is playing her fiddle on songs like Highway on the Water and in a few other places on the record too. Mac McAnally's on this album. And for a Corey Crowder co-produced record, I am never that kind to a Corey Crowder production. I feel like he has a much lighter touch and the actual instruments breathe a lot better on this. My favorite tracks include Highway on the Water. I really love that detail where he just says, no bananas, that's bad luck. Because I didn't know this was like a weird urban legend that you can't bring bananas on a fishing boat. But again, that's just like a fun little detail that makes this album feel kind of lived in and authentic. But I also just love all the fiddle on that song and the melody. I think Songs For You is super simple, but I think it's like low key, so romantic and a really memorable melody. I'll play my, I'll play my, I'll play my songs for you. Fish All Day definitely has my favorite wordplay on the whole album. I love everything from sunshine medication and maritime meditation to the fun little throwaway line of rain or shine or rum, whatever. And then I think Savannah is an excellent song as well. Feeling anything but blue with a red fish on the line. It's just got that traveling south kind of rollicking energy about it. It kind of reminds me of Brett Eldridge's Magnolia. It also kind of reminds me of uh, Randy Hauser's Evangeline, which is on an album called Magnolia. So for some reason, this song reminds me of Magnolia, but man, I just, it, I love it. And don't get me wrong, you're still gonna get a lot of the big pop country production on songs like Made by the Water or Florida Boy Forever or Sunday Service in the Sand, which I just feel like it's overdone. It's overproduced on a few of those songs, but for the most part, I just think this album felt like a real breath of fresh air. It is a perfect summer album. I don't know, I think he just did it. I, you know, a weird way, I'm very proud of Brian Kelly for not letting himself be written into a corner. I know it's like, oh, Grady, you're really gonna be inspired by some celebrity with millions of dollars, but I just think as a human, it's hard for us to ever start blazing a new trail when people already think of us in one context. And we've all always thought of him as the other dude that's not the lead singer in Florida Georgia Line. And on this album, he's front and center. It's his perspective. There are no rap verses. There's no uh, the making me swerve, insert video clip here. 
And I think much like when Taylor Swift climbed a mountain of her former selves and knocked them all down, I always find that so cool when stars are able to keep growing and keep pushing and giving us something new. So overall, I think I'm gonna give it a seven out of 10. And now that I have wax poetic about this album, let's see what y'all had to say on Reddit. Top comment says, big fan of Kenny Chesney and all the different beach country kind of songs. And I'm a big fan of this album so far after one listen through all the new songs. This one says season one implies we will get two albums. Am I correct here? You know, who knows about that one? That's kind of like when Keith Urban said the speed of now part one, although I consider that more of a threat. This comment says, this is exactly what you want out of a beach album, catchy and upbeat. I can see myself enjoying this album both alone when I'm really missing the warmer weather and when I'm actually at the beach, which is really what I want out of this subgenre. Good variety of songs too. I like the party songs as much as the slower ones as well. Then we got Flatland Cavalry's Welcome to Countryland. Some things never change. So in case you're unfamiliar, Flatland Cavalry is a band out of Texas known for music that's easy on the ears and heavy on the heart. You might think of them as a little bit of like a sweeter version of the Turnpike Troubadours. They have released two albums thus far, Humble Folks and then Homeland Insecurity, which sits behind me. I love that cover. I love that album. I love their fiddle work. And I love just how pleasant their music is. And now they've got this third album, Welcome to Countryland, got a big old bus on the cover because I guess they have moved to Nashville and they're some themes of travel, you get some different cities on this album, but for the most part, it's kind of about contentedness. It's a very friendly record. I mean, they literally say in the opening track, country is what country means to you. They at one point say, it's good to be back round here again. They say, tilt your chair back. Tilt your chair back. It's kind of a very laid back feeling record and there's not as much fight. And I do think there's not as much like immediacy when it comes to listening to this as maybe you've heard on their previous records. But it's still a super nice album. I feel like I was a touch disappointed on my first couple listens, although it has grown on me a lot, but only in comparison to the Flatland Cavalry I already know, if that makes sense. Flatland Cavalry's bass line is so much higher and they do so many things that I absolutely love in their music that I'm only comparing them to themselves. But I think over time I've named that it's that laid back energy that isn't quite clicking for me as much. I think the production on this album is really casual and it works better in some songs than others. On stuff like Tilt Your Chair Back and a lot of the songs in the back half of the record, it feels kind of like front porch vibey, almost like a live setting for the album and it just, it really fits with the kind of poetic, gentle way that Cleto Cordero tends to deliver things. But on the front half of the record with songs like Some Things Never Change or A Cowboy Knows How, which that song is really catchy. That's a Luke Combs co-write on this album. And I think I really like it, but I do think the production on those kind of bigger songs can feel a little bit messy to me. And that is not helped by the fact that I think Cleto sometimes is delivering stuff like off the beat. It's almost like so casual of a delivery style that I'm like, dude, I wanna get you a metronome. And some of that sophistication and just tightness in the sound that I was talking about on the Midland record, I was like, ugh. I want some of that here on this Flatland record. I think once my ear kind of adjusted and I was really listening to the songs for the songs themselves, you still have that same wide-eyed wonder that makes Flatland Cavalry such a special band. There's a song near the end of the record called Off Broadway that just finds Cleto looking around St. Louis, Missouri and kind of falling in love once again and just seeing the world for what it is. And you've got this accordion backing it. And I love songs like that. And they're one of the only bands that really do that. Somewhere off the Broadway, St. Louis, Missouri, but I feel love once again. They take the time to look around themselves and just kind of appreciate. Same thing as songs like Tilt Your Chair Back. It's just kind of stay here, be with us, tilt your chair back, life's pretty good. And that's that natural hopefulness that I think is like the secret juju of Flatland Cavalry. There's a really pretty song on here called Life Without You, which is a duet with Cleto and his now wife, Caitlin Butts, who's a great artist in her own right. And this song is kind of directly referencing their biggest hit, A Life Where We Work Out. And this is now imagining a life without you. Let me in the pill fight, long days and lonely nights. 
and I love the opening stanza of this song. He says, a life without you would be a Tuesday at the motel by the Denny's on the dingy side of town and talks about the rain coming down the window and she talks about how life without you would be kind of being in this fog of disillusion and revisiting her journal entries from her younger days and it's very much the inverse of a life where we work out which was them sort of almost fearing for the state of their relationship by imagining what could be. This is the opposite of that, and it's cool. I love the lyrics of Daydreamer as well, where Cleto is imagining the hard work he's doing in a more like supernatural celestial realm where he's roto-tilling rainbows and sowing stardust in his mind. It's just so pretty and evocative. In general, Cleto is kind of like his head is up in the clouds as he is in love on this album. At one point he describes a starlit angel wrestling from his calloused hands all all those feelings that make life worth living, which is such an extra and dramatic and beautiful songwritery way to say you're in love. I think all the fiddle work on the album sounds great. I love that we get a harmonica on songs like Getting By. I love that song, Getting By. And I'm such a fan of how they use percussion, which is not in an overly overbearing way. Although there are some times on this album where it's not so easy on the ears. And I definitely find myself listening to the back half of this record more than the first half. So overall, I think I'd give this album a seven out of 10 as well. Still love Flatland Cavalry, just want them to have a little bit tighter of a sound. Here's what y'all had to say about it on Reddit. Top comment was, I take no joy in saying this as I have physical copies of all three of their projects up to this point. Upon first listen, it was extremely underwhelming. It could be that my enthusiasm was killed since half the album was essentially released already, but honestly, the first half of the album sounded phoned in to me. Another one says, definitely on the lighter side compared to their last two albums, but still a great album with quality songwriting. If they needed an album to please both their fans and potentially some people in Nashville, this album would be the one that does so. Another one says, are you guys kidding me? This album is fantastic. Nowhere in country right now do you have anyone incorporating harmonica, fiddle, and steel guitar with fantastic songwriting. This is pure country. The cherry on top is Cleto's great songwriting. Can't wait to see him live. I'm doing that thing where I talk way too much about every single thing in this video. So these next ones will be a little bit shorter, but they're a little bit shorter albums. And first up is Hannah Dasher's The Half Record. The first time I saw Hannah Dasher's name was actually on TikTok. I would get these cooking videos where she's like, stand by your pan. Hey Karen, get out of here with your nuts and your cranberries. I ain't making trail mix, I'm making chicken salad. Woo! The old school way, like we do it back home. Stand by your pan. And she just seems like really funny, like a lot of personality. But then I saw her in the credits of Ian Munsick's Coyote Cry album earlier this year. She was a co-writer on one of my favorite songs. But I hadn't actually heard her music until I checked out this EP. And I thought it was really impressive. It really had some of like the confidence and just sort of fun swagger of a Miranda Lambert record. Also kind of reminded me a little bit of Lainey Wilson's album from earlier this year. Songs like You're Gonna Love Me are just kind of confident confident in a way that is so likable. If I say play Chattahoochee and you know disagree. When she talks about how she hates driving through Atlanta and how if your accent gets thicker after drink number three, you're gonna love me. And then she kind of laughs that line off and goes right into saying that she thinks Clint Eastwood and Sam Elliott still got it going on. You're like, okay, this girl doesn't take herself too seriously and she's funny and charismatic in how she delivers stuff. And then you got that really cool like electric guitar groove underneath it. There's a similar energy on left right where she is talking about how this guy is going left right left right in a relationship and she is making a call for focus of like it, you better put a ring on her left right Leave This Bar and Shoes definitely have more of a, a poppier production rather than a rockier production and for me that is not as much what makes her special although I know most modern listening ears gravitate more toward that kind of music, but um, I still think it was a really impressive, fun like EP to get into. I don't even know if it's her debut, but it was my debut to Hannah Dasher, and I'd, I'd give it, geez, a lot of, this video is just kind of a, you know, seven out of 10 video, but that's what it is. Then I really want to talk about Riley Green's Behind the Bar. In short, I feel the same way about this Riley Green project that I kind of do about all Riley Green projects, which is I just absolutely love the music and the words are 
fine. Like, I think I am starting to accept that Riley Green is not trying to be Cleto Cordero and sing about rototilling rainbows while he is sowing stardust. I think I have accepted that that's not Riley's vision for his own career. He likes to paint in broader brushstrokes about the South and relationships and hard work and good times. And a lot of people love it and aren't looking for anything that much deeper than that. I really dislike the title track. Behind the Bar opens this EP and I just think it's like easily the worst song here. Everybody's living in love this is a tailgate anthem that survived the bro country era. They're circling up the trucks and the drinks are pouring and the smoke is going in the air and it's like, so grab you a cup, fill it on up and, and come out and be behind the bar. We haven't had a song where the buzzing is happening in a few years now, but the buzzing is back on behind the bar. But just table that song if you have similar taste to me and I think there's a lot more to enjoy later on in the album. I think Put Em On Mine has that same energy as my favorite Riley Green single in Love By Now. It feels romantic and flirty and super country and likable. You can put them on That Was Us probably has my favorite lyrics on the record just because it gives you so many details of like the Go Gators sign and the Vidalias growing and the BF Goodrich. It's a song that, man, those little details just bring songs to life. This is a duet with Jesse Alexander, who's a great singer and songwriter, and I think it totally works. Closing track on here is pretty interesting. It's called That's My Dixie. In this song, Riley Green and the co-writers, Jesse Alexander and Randy Montana, are kind of pushing back on the narrative that the South is just backwards and just racist or anything like that, where he says, yeah, I know there's hate out there and there's people that will judge people by the color of their skin, but that's not my Dixie. That's not the place that I see when I look around. And even though there is this war-torn past, he's saying that they're turning these towns where people do love each other into battlegrounds and that that doesn't sit well with him. The song starts so heavy and then it goes into a place where he says, homemade pies and Georgia pines, old bird dogs and Spanish moss and sweet tea. You know, he just kind of rests in like, that's the Dixie that I know. That's the comforting, sweet Dixie. And if that were the only time that Riley used that kind of list of Southernisms, then I think it would hit a little bit different. But so much of his writing style is built around what I call like a Pinterest board of the South, where you're seeing Chevys and BB guns and sayings from your grandfather that it doesn't hit me quite as hard. All through this record, I think Riley delivers these songs really well. I like hearing his voice. He sings with a real conviction. You get a lot of kind of like twangy country rock. That's more Riley's sound. I think the guitar and steel on this, it just sounds really nice. It's produced and mixed super well. So so overall, it's something I like but don't love. Like it's something I wouldn't ever want to turn off, but I wouldn't really reach for first. And so I think I'd give it like a six or six and a half out of 10. Okay, I have honestly been filming for an hour and a half and I'm kind of talked out. I know I didn't get to everything, but I said at the beginning of 2021, I was releasing myself from the pressure to listen to every single thing that comes out. It's just too hard to. It's not a healthy mindset to try to keep up with that rat race constantly. It makes me not enjoy the music. And so this is as I'm at capacity right now. This is as many new things as I could listen to. But hopefully something in there is something for you. And these are the albums that people kind of were interested in. And yeah, go check one of them out. Let me know your thoughts down below. And I'll be back soon with a bunch more stuff. Go grab the merch. I love you all. Farewell. Farewell.